is the universe twice as old as we think it is? Well, that's exactly what this research paper released this month from Gupta at the University of Ottawa is claiming, estimating an age of 26.7 billion years old, almost double the currently accepted value of 13.8 billion years old. Now, the motivation for their study was something that I've talked a lot about on this channel before. It all comes back to JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope that has found galaxies at huge distances, which we're seeing as they were 13 and a half billion years ago, meaning that those galaxies existed when the universe, we think, was just 300 million years old. Old. But when we work out how heavy they are, how much mass they have in stars, they're too big. There's not been enough time for that many stars to have formed if the universe is truly 300 million years old at that point that we're seeing them. So Gupta's solution was to look at different models of the universe that could fit the JWST data better. Essentially making the universe older and also so that the light from these distant galaxies has been traveling for much longer before it's gotten to us. So in this video, we're going to go on a deep dive into this and we're going to break down, first of all, what these different models are, including this tired light hypothesis, to what other problems in cosmology this solves, including the impact on the crisis in cosmology. Three, what data this model doesn't fit and to be honest, why I'm a little skeptical of this result. And for what else then could explain these galaxies that JWST has spotted that are apparently too big? All right, so let's start with the big thing, models of the universe. So our current best model of the universe that we have that can fit the observations and in simulations turn the fluctuations of the early universe that we see imprinted in the cosmic microwave background into the distribution of galaxies we see today. That model is called Lambda CDM. CDM stands for cold dark matter. So that's dark matter, so matter that we can't see because it doesn't interact with light at all, seeds the formation of galaxies by clumping together, which you can do that because it's cold and those clumps then merge together, making larger structures over time. Then you've got lambda for the expansion of the universe, which explains the redshift of light from distant galaxies. So as light travels through the expanding universe, the wavelength of light gets stretched to longer, redder wavelengths, hence redshift. Lambda CDM is also the model that gives us that famous breakdown of where all of the energy budget of the universe went into. So 5% in normal matter that makes up us and planets and stars, 27% in dark matter, and then 68% in what we call dark energy. The name for whatever is causing the accelerated expansion of the universe. And it does all of this by assuming that Einstein's theory of general relativity is also the correct theory of gravity. But while Lambda CDM fits a lot of observations of our universe, there are some issues with it, which I've talked about before on this channel, including the so-called crisis in cosmology, where our two main methods that we have for calculating the age of the universe are giving answers that have started to diverge from each other. So if you take Lambda CDM and do all the fits to the cosmic microwave background, you get a value of 13.8 billion years old. But if you measure the expansion rate of the universe, which then gives you how long the universe has been around for, using at the distances to nearby galaxies, you get a value that's more like 13.3 billion years old. Now, the currently accepted value for the age of the universe, and the one that you'll always hear as astrophysicists parroting, is that 13.8 billion years old that comes from the Lambda CDM fit to the cosmic microwave background. And the assumption is that we're not measuring the distances to nearby galaxies accurately enough for that 13.3 billion years old estimate to be quite right. And that's something that we are hoping that JWST will be able to solve, take away sort of the observational bias that we currently have in those measurements. And again, I've talked about that on this channel before as well. I'll link that video uh, down in the description if you want to watch it. So with 13.8 billion years old as the accepted measurement and with the measurement of the expansion rate of the universe, you can then work out, okay, if the light that I'm receiving from an object has been redshifted by a certain factor, you can calibrate the amount of redshift with how how long that light has been traveling for, and therefore uh, how old was the universe when the light from the object you're looking at actually left and started on its journey towards Earth where we then 
detect it. So if light was redshifted by a factor of 10 by the expansion of the universe, so we always use the letter Z to represent redshift, then the light has been traveling for 13.3 billion years and was emitted when the universe was around 500 million years old. And what this new paper by Gupta has essentially said is what if that calibration of the redshift is off slightly? And the idea that they've posed is that it might not be just the expansion of the universe that can cause this stretching of a wavelength of light, this red shift. They've said it could also be something else that's happening at the same time as the expansion, something that was posed a hundred years ago and has since become known as tired light. Where as light travels through the universe and it collides with other particles, whether that's, you know, normal matter or whether it's other particles of light, photons, then in those collisions it loses a bit of energy. Kind of like, you know, a cue ball in a game of pool or snooker will transfer energy to the coloured balls and lose energy itself in the collision. And if a photon has less energy, it has a longer wavelength of light. Less waves arrive every second, it's almost like a little bit of a lazier wave as opposed to a very high energy wave where lots and lots and lots of waves arrive in a second, and that's a much higher frequency and therefore a much shorter wavelength. Now, this idea was first proposed by the Swiss astronomer Fritz Zwicky in 1929, right after Edwin Hubble first recorded how the redshift of a galaxy was correlated with its distance away from us. And while it might seem like really obvious to us now, because the idea of an expanding universe is, is so ingrained in our minds and such a foundational part of astrophysics, you know, back then there was this new observation that no one had expected and seen before and, and there was loads of different ideas being raised for what could possibly be causing this, this correlation between redshift and distance and one of those was this idea of tired light in a static non-expanding universe. Now the expanding universe model is what eventually won out because it fit our observations better, it fit the maths all checked out as well. So one test in particular is that in an expanding universe, the surface brightness of a galaxy, so the amount of light you get per some unit area, decreases with distance. And also distant objects actually appear larger than they should because they used to be closer when the light was first emitted. Whereas in a static universe that's not expanding with tired light, causing redshift, the surface brightness should be constant because distant galaxies will be fainter, but they'll also appear smaller to us as well as they get more distance. So that ratio of brightness to area stays the same. That's not what we see in our observations of the distant universe, though instead our observations fit the expanding universe model, and so that was what was accepted. And tired light hasn't really been considered as a serious hypothesis since the mid-20th century, maybe. And any time it was raised by someone, uh, it tended to be on the fringes of the sort of astrophysics community, to put it politely. <laughs> But what's interesting about this research from Gupta is that they're not claiming there's no expansion of the universe, but that the redshift of light from distant objects could be caused by both the expansion and tired light. So a hybrid model of the two. And when they combine them, they find that at least with a few tweaks to lambda CDM, where, you know, sort of like all the physical constants like the strength of gravity, G, and the speed of light, C, are allowed to sort of vary ever so slightly, just sort of little fluctuations, but those fluctuations are also coupled together. If they do that, then this hybrid model of the expansion and tired light fits the JWST data the best, as they've shown here in this plot with the the blue line, the, the blue data points here is JWST data. So that means that you've got two processes causing redshift. So if you have a measured redshift of a galaxy, then the expansion rate has to be less to explain that redshift. And if the expansion rate is less, then to get to the current size of the universe, the universe has to have been around for longer which is how you end up concluding that the universe is older than we thought at 26.7 billion years old. As I said, it essentially changes that calibration between redshift and the length of time that the light has been traveling for. So instead of a redshift of 10, meaning that the light has been traveling for 13.3 billion years after being emitted when the universe was just 500 million years old, in this hybrid expansion and tired light model that Gupta present, a redshift of a factor of 10 
means the light has been traveling for 21 billion years and was emitted when the universe was 5.8 billion years old. Now, this doesn't just solve the problem of JWST's apparently two massive galaxies, but also the problem of how you even get supermassive black holes in the early universe. The only way we know to make a black hole is a supernova, and that makes a black hole from five to a hundred times the mass of the sun. But to go from that piddly little mass to millions or even billions of times the mass of the sun, these supermassive black holes that we see in just a few hundred millions of years of the lifetime of the universe means those black holes would have to grow way above the physical limit on the rate of growth of a black hole which if you didn't know, there was a physical limit on how fast black holes could grow. Again, I've talked about that on this channel before, and I'll link the video in the description down below. So if the universe was older, it would definitely help solve that problem of how long you've got for black holes to grow to be that big, along with making the crisis in cosmology where those two methods for measuring the expansion rate and the age of the universe don't match, completely moot. But while that story sounds great and like that hypothesis is just wrapped up with a nice neat little bow to solve all of our problems, this research does conveniently ignore some observations of the universe. Either it just doesn't mention them at all, or that it hasn't been tested against yet. Which, you know, Gupta do actually name in their conclusions, like the cosmic microwave background or Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So that's having the right ratio of hydrogen to helium to lithium in the very early universe. Universe, and baryonic acoustic oscillations as well, so fluctuations in the early universe that have led to large-scale structures in the distribution of galaxies that we see today. But this paper conspicuously ignores some of the other observations that put limits on the age of the universe that have nothing to do with these big cosmological models, like, for example, the age of the oldest stars, and more specifically clusters of stars, which we can measure with much less uncertainty than a single star, the oldest of which are estimated to be around about 13 to 14 billion years old. So I'm a little sceptical, as you should be with any idea in science, you know, as intriguing as this sort of hybrid model sounds, it's not going to overrule decades worth of research to the contrary, unless it has a lot more evidence in its favor. So I take this paper and any, you know, sort of like news stories that you see about it with a very large pinch of salt. But then how else do you explain the overmassive galaxies JWST has spotted at high redshift or very large distances? Well, first of all, I really doubt the redshift that they're claimed to be at. The drop-off feature that we use as a way marker to calculate the redshift is really easy to spot in a spectrum of light, so a trace of how much light at each wavelength you get. But these high redshift candidates, like redshift 15, have been identified in images first, which let large ranges of wavelengths of light through. And so the redshift ends up being calculated with a much larger uncertainty. And we actually had this demonstrated earlier this year by the JWST Sears team, who followed up on a Redshift 16 candidate galaxy that was first identified in JWST images by then taking a spectrum with JWST and found it was actually a galaxy at Redshift 4.9 mimicking the brightness of what a higher redshift galaxy would look like in the images. But I don't just doubt the distances, the high redshifts of these galaxies, but also the calculation of these impossibly high masses as well. I've made a whole video on this before if you want to check it out, but essentially you have to convert from how bright a galaxy is to how much mass in stars is there by assuming you know how many of each size and type of star there is in that galaxy that are giving out a certain amount of light each. We assume that spread of the type and size of stars is the same as that we see in the Milky Way and in nearby galaxies, but that might be a really bad assumption of what the very early universe was actually like. And it turns out if you just tweak that spread of stars slightly, just to have a few more, you know, bigger, more massive stars that give out a little bit more light, then the galaxies are no longer overmassive, and the whole problem goes away. Which was the whole sort of motivation for this research by Gupta in the first place. But despite my skepticism of this paper, I really loved reading it because it just cemented in my mind how 
We're going through like an era of change in astrophysics thanks to JWST. You know, it reminds me so much of the fact that I would love to have been around at the time of Hubble's observations of, you know, the redshift being correlated with distance and no one being able to necessarily explain yet what it was and the arguments between tired light versus expansion of the universe. And you know, while it might not be at the same sort of like paradigm shifting level as that, I still think future astronomers are going to do the same thing and look back and say, man, I wished that I was there and lived through those first few years after JWST was launched. Before we get to the bloopers, I just want to say a big thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Do you want a free and easy way to learn more about cosmology. Then you need Brilliant, a website and an app that is the best way to learn new concepts in maths, science, and computer science interactively, with thousands of lessons and new ones added each month, including a whole course on astrophysics with a section on cosmology that I think is great. But many of you also talk to me about how, you know, you'd love to do more astrophysics or study it in the future, but you're worried about how good your math skills are. Well, Brilliant is a great way to practice your math so it becomes second nature to you. You know, you can even take a quick quiz when you sign up so that you can be matched with content at your level, whether you're a complete beginner or you're ready to write programs for a quantum computer. I think the interactivity really shines in their maths courses, especially the geometry ones, which might help you wrap your head around how the surface area of a galaxy changes in an expanding universe. So to try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on that link in the video description down below. And the first 200 of you that go to that link are going to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now, roll those bloopers gonna sit on a cushion because I am old and my bones hurt and sitting cross-legged on the floor is kind of painful now. <sighs> so while that story sounds great and like that hypothesis is just wrapped up with a nice neat little blow and blow? No. <laughs> wrapped up with a nice neat little blow. <laughs> There's a an ice cream man outside. I much prefer getting interrupted by an ice cream man rather than, you know, a, a motorbike roaring past. I'm like, yay, children are happy, the ice cream man is coming, la la la, it's the noise of summer. But the paper conspicuously, conspicuous, conspicuously, I'll get there eventually. Space is hard, words are harder. 